In this series, we try to find difficult topics um, that we can discuss in a measured and um, multifarious way to show people how you can think, to keep an open mind and think about all sides of difficult issues and then make up your own mind because that's what a library is all about. Come and do the research, look at the text um, and the topics and then make up your own mind about it. Then walk away but keep an open mind in case somebody comes to you and says something else. So we like to bring together people who can offer nuanced views, sometimes opposing views, but give you the nuances in a, a civil discourse about it um, that you can then take away and it will help inform your own views of it, but we want you to have your own views of whatever these difficult topics are. So to lead us in this discussion, we, also, we actually usually have a moderator. We want it to be civil, but we never know what might come up. And our moderator today is Dominique Anderson. She comes to us from the Wondery. She's brand new at Vanderbilt. She's a program officer at the Wondery, which is our innovation center uh, at the engineering school. Um, and she uh, is a specialist or likes to think a lot about uh, inclusivity and um, equity in the STEM fields in particular. She is, however, an expert in crisis management. So when we get to the questions and answers period of this discussion, I think she can help make sure that we all remain in that civil discourse mode. Uh, so here she is, Dominique. She's going to introduce our speakers, and then we'll get right into the topic. And we really want this to be um, interactive. So if you have questions as we go, certainly want to have a discussion afterwards for sure, if you want to be polite during the, little, the brief presentations. But even during it, if you want to raise your hand and ask a question, this is a forum to discuss these um, interesting and um, important issues of our day. So thanks for coming. Put my coffee there since I apparently don't ever want to sleep this evening, so that's good. Um, hello. So I'm glad to be here. It's uh, an interesting topic, and it's always, always interesting when you talk about anything related to equity, diversity, inclusion, race, gender, all, all of our wonderful rainbow of things. It always gets interesting, but I would implore everyone to speak from a place of openness and honesty, and we can't fix things if we don't talk about things, correct? Great. So with that, I will introduce our speakers. Uh, Mark Scala is the chief curator for the Frist Center for Visual Arts. Isn't that exciting? I love that place. Uh, Mark Scala is the chief curator. His major, major exhibitions have focused on the subject of human vulnerability and transformation in global contemporary art. That's pretty amazing. Um, fairy tales, monsters, and the genetic imagination, considered the theme of the hybrid body in folklore, science fiction, and genetic engineering. <gasps> oh, that's exciting too, isn't it? Paint Made Flesh from 2009. It featured expressionistic figure painting from the US, Germany, and Britain since World War, World War II. Okay, so Scala is currently organizing Chaos and Awe, painting for the 21st century, an international survey of artists who convey a sense of anxiety and sublimity arising from the contemplation of an increasingly unsustainable social imaginary. That was a lot of words. Did you all get all of that? That was exciting. Wonderful. Helmut Smith, Helmut W. Smith. Martha Rivers Ingram Professor of History and Director of the Digital Humanities Center. Also lots of words, wonderful. Helmut Walser Smith, I like that middle name, Walser. That's exciting, not Walter. Now we know it. They put it in there, I didn't ask. Helmut Walser Smith as a historian of modern Germany with particular interest in the history of nation building and nationalism, religious history and the history of anti-Semitism. He's the author of German Nationalism and Religious Conflict and a number of edited collections, including the Oxford Handbook of Modern German History. That sounds like a good read. Is that a good read? Okay. Many pages, exciting. Uh, Protestants, Catholics, and Jews in Germany the Holocaust and other genocides, history representations, ethics, and with Werner Bergerman, Bergerman exclusionary violence, anti-Semitic riots in modern German history. Oh my goodness, that's exciting. 
His book, The Butcher's Tale, Murder and Anti-Semitism Anti in a German Town, received the Frankel Prize in Contemporary History and was an LA Times nonfiction book of the year. Well, look at that. It was also translated into French, Dutch, Polish, and German, where it received an accolade as one of the three most innovative works published in 2002. Bravo. Okay, so, awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2014, Smith's project is titled Finding Germany, a, Dis a History of Discovery and Salvage, 1500 to 2000, which we published with W.W. W. Norton in the United States and C.H. Beck in Germany. This work, he says, starts with the first highly accurate two-dimensional image of Germany on a map circa 1500, and is about how Germany has been seen, mapped, described, experienced, and thought about before, during, and after nationalism. Isn't that exciting? You guys are in for a treat. We have some real thought leaders here. Wonderful. You all have thoughts, things, right? We're moving on to our thoughts and speaking portion. Wonderful. Join us. Actually, I'm going to stand here. You do it. You stand here and I will move. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me here. I uh, really look forward to this conversation. Been looking forward to it uh, for weeks and weeks. I'm so honored to be here with Helmut. Uh, his, uh, his books all sound amazing. I'm going to go home and read every one of them. Maybe not in one night, but um, give me a month. Okay, let's do that. Okay, so um, it's a complicated question. The question of, you know, how do we sort of address the uh, the uh, problematics of Confederate statuary, and so you know, looking at this, I mean, my my initial impulse is is that um, that public public monuments, public memorials on public land need to be responsive to the public, and so that's sort of that that's where I started. Um, but then I started asking myself some of these questions. Um, you know, what are these things? What are these monuments? And, and really, it's, it's just a piece of metal, or it's, it's a piece of stone. And why do, why do some people hold them in reverence, and other people uh, revile them? And it's really not the thing itself, of course. It's the symbol. It's the symbolism of the thing. And the public monument is essentially, uh, and if we're talking specifically about Confederate monuments, they stand for something. And it's, it's the things that they stand for, of course, that really get people riled up. You know, I, when I, I moved to Richmond from, uh, from Pittsburgh back in, uh, in 1977, and I looked at the Confederate uh, statuary on Monument Avenue, and it was just sort of part of the texture. Nobody paid attention to them. It seemed like they were fairly benign. But after living there for a while, I realized that people in the, in the community of color, uh, the black community, which is a, a majority, a minority majority city, so a, a great number of people were really offended by these, these statues, by the statuary, and by the, by the things that they stood for. Of course, it's the capital of the Confederacy, so in a sense, it's a museum in and of itself. So the question, some of the questions I've asked is, well, what does the removal of statues mean? Does that mean we're erasing history of some of the uh, 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 apologists for the sort of uh, uh, Confederate side of the argument will, will, would have it? Uh, the reenactor side or whatever, you know, are we really erasing history if we remove these sculptures? And I'd like to address that question as we proceed. Or, uh, and do we, re do we erase the sentiment that these things uh, stand for. And so if, if um, you perceive a, the, a, a statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest as being a representative of white supremacy and hate, and taking that away, do white supremacy and hate disappear with the statue? Of course not. Who determines what is historically significant? We understand, of course, that most of the statuary that, we're, that is under discussion is not period. Like, it wasn't made between 1861 and 1865. It was generally made between 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, all the way into 1960s and 1970s. So as far as their capacity to reflect a particular moment in history, the moment in history that they're reflecting is not 
from 1861 to 1865. They're reflecting a certain public sentiment about that time in the past, and that public sentiment then is the, it, the historical value of it is that it is representing how people felt, how the, the United Daughters of the Confederacy felt, and the, and the communities felt as they erected, the commissioned these and erected these uh, statues in the, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And it's, I think, a fair statement to say that a lot of times what they felt was a sense not just of sentiment for this sort of uh, noble cause, which is oftentimes the argument, but there's also a, a feeling of the statue as being a, a way of asserting our supremacy and continuing uh, to, to, to assert our supremacy. So that is a historical statement that is interesting for us to look back at and say, okay, well, this, this is how people felt in the 30s and 40s. Do we need statues to tell us how people felt in the 30s and 40s about white supremacy in, you know, in, in the South especially? We, I mean, history is not necessarily in, embodied in artifacts. Artifacts can, can give you a false sort of idea of history, or, the, or, the, or at least a very s singular idea of history that's not, uh, that, that, that doesn't embrace the entire story. And so when you talk about the erasure of a certain kind of history, the statuary itself may be understood as, as erasing a larger view of history. You know, if the, if the statue sort of ennobles Jeb Stewart, you know, does it really talk about 200 years or 300 years, 350 years of slavery? You know, that's the larger view of history that that one piece of artwork is meant to erase. And so, so it becomes really, really complicated, I think, and, and a compelling subject for discussion. You know, I work in an art museum. The art museum is really designed to, to preserve and protect and to study uh, objects from the present and objects from the past and to put them into context. So I thought it'd be interesting to look at a little bit of history in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, this wonderful painting was on view a few years ago at the Frisch Center by uh, Johannes Adam Ortel, a German uh, artist who escaped to the United States uh, after the uh, revolutions in Germany, uh, very anti-monarchical revolutions in Germany, and so he painted this image of uh, patriots pulling down the statue of King George, King George III. And, you know, obviously he's trying to draw a contemporary message from this, uh, from this event that took place in Bowling Green in Manhattan in, in the 18th century. Um, interestingly, he placed Native Americans in the lower left-hand corner, so he's talking about you know, this idea of the pulling down of the statue as being a, uh, an argument for liberty and, a, and an argument against tyranny, but the Native Americans are left out of the picture. And so he's already taking this, uh, this political act and making another political statement from it. Saddam in Baghdad, we were, you know, I felt really good when I saw on TV that they pulled down the statue of Saddam in Baghdad. I thought, okay, yeah, he's a tyrant, you know, he's, he monument, he erected that to himself. So it's not like there was a public commission, you know, 10 or 15 years after the fact who said, yeah, we need to memorialize Baghdad because, or Saddam because he was so great. Um, you know, he erected it himself. And so a lot of times such statuary is, is, Really, the, the, uh, the, the authorship of it is really the, the, uh, 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 the dictator, the person who wants to, to show his, uh, his uh, power and authority and to give the implication that it, is, that it exists in perpetuity. Um, it's really interesting to me that the people who tore down the statue were not this, the Baghdadis who supposedly had been oppressed or who had been oppressed by uh, Saddam, but it was the American troops. So this idea of the victor coming in and toppling the symbol of the vanquished, I think, and of course we know that that, that has happened throughout history, so that's an ongoing thing. Is that right? Is that wrong? That's what we'll discuss. And I love this quote. The, uh, the Taliban destroyed the Buddha temples of, uh, of Bamiyan. And, you know, it was really sort of interesting to see this quote by the Taliban leader, Mullah Omar, who said basically... You know, I had no intention, no desire to destroy this, this great Buddhist monument. But then when, when people came in and wanted to pay for its preservation, I was so annoyed by the fact that they wanted to, to give their money to this inert object from antiquity instead of giving it to help the starving people of Af Afghanistan that I decided to just have it blown up. And so essentially it's kind of an act of peak. You know, sort of, uh, you know, you irritate me, I'll just... I'll just knock this thing down. And so this whole idea of, 
of statuary as being uh, uh, something that one preserves from antiquity because it tells us something about the past and it's a great treasure. Of course, this was a UNESCO World Heritage Site and so that, I think, uh, uh, makes it, puts it into a different level than, than a Confederate statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest in the Tennessee State House, in a slightly different level. So the perspective of time, this idea that maybe we should just wait we shouldn't erect monuments or statues or, you know, to, to our heroes until a, a, a enough of an interval of time has passed so we can sort of worm out whether they were really as heroic as we thought they were. So we can decide for ourselves whether, you know, they, the, the sins of Thomas Jefferson outweigh the virtues of Thomas Jefferson. And so, and there's an argument for that. But so this, I think, is... Um, is the embodiment of that argument. This is the Stone Mountain carving in Georgia, begun in 1923, so that's what, 35, 45, 55, 58 years after the end of the Civil War, and this was on land that had been donated to the United Daughters of the Confederacy, so it wasn't, pub it wasn't public land, and so they commissioned artists to work on this, and a series of artists worked on it over years. It eventually was acquired, and it was a, a site where the Ku Klux Klan could, could feel comfortable in gathering, so it became a rallying point, and that's, I think, one of the issues around Charlottesville, you know, the, the, the statue as the rallying, as, as, the, as the place where you sort of gather around because it is your cohering symbol. And that, I think, is how this functioned. Uh, the state of Georgia acquired the, uh, the land in, in 1958, and the, uh, the carving was completed in 1972. So it was completed 107 years after the fact. And so, um, you know, does that somehow, uh, uh, the... the the, the lapse of time, does that somehow make it okay to have that? Or does that somehow actually uh, subvert the idea that this is, this is uh, a, a historical artifact that is deserving of study? You know, I would argue that it's not. It's not a particularly good work of art either. And so that brings us to the question of preserving works of art. And I think it's an important question. You know, how do you know what is, you know, I'm working now on an exhibition of Roman art from the British Museum. And the, the, the statuary, the monuments, I mean, some of those emperors were real brutes. I mean, they were really awful. But you can't tell that by looking at, their, at the, uh, the object, you know, the, the portrait sculpture or the figural sculpture. Um, but they're beautiful works of art. And so maybe that's the argument that, that we do have a response, and of course I work in an art museum, so we do have a responsibility then to preserve that, that dimension of our culture, that dimension of our heritage, even if the things that they represent are hateful to us. And so that's a question. I thought it was really interesting. Some of you may have read the story about the, uh, the uh, uh, manufacturer in New England that created these not very good works of art, basically for both Union and uh, Northern and Southern cities, where they could commission uh, the sculpture, and it's the same sculpture essentially, only the one on the left has U.S. on its belt, the one on the right has C.S. on its belt. So they're not unique. They're not, there's nothing really that special about them. They're sort of trinkets. Um, still, there is some historical interest in that, but I would say that there is as much historical interest in that as there is historical value to saving old warehouses or old bridges or something. I mean, everything from the past is part of history. Do we need to save everything from the past? I think it has to be unique. And this is unique. This is absolutely unique. I would warrant that nobody here has ever seen anything quite like it. Um, in, not in this life, anyway. So you've seen it on Route 65. So the question of good art versus bad art. Do we save the good art and do we, is it okay to get rid of bad art? You know, I'm an art guy, and so I always try to err on the side of, of uh, caution. But not all art needs to be, you know, perpetually saved for eternity. You know, this might be one of those that doesn't need to be perpetually saved for eternity. Um, Art in public view versus art on public land. This is in public view, but it's on private property. And so basically, it's not something that I think that the public has, has any right or, or sort of uh, 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 a responsibility to argue against. I mean, we may want to plant a bamboo forest in front of it, and that's perfectly fine, because that would be on public land uh, on, the, uh, on the highway. Um, but as far as demanding its removal or its destruction, I don't think we really have a right to do that, as bad as it is. And sometimes, in a fee, uh, 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 bit of fancy, I like to imagine that the artist who made this was actually very sophisticated and polished, and what he wanted to do was to embody the grotesquerie of Nathan Bedford Forrest. And so what he's done is make him into this sort of 
shrieking demon from hell. Um, and so, <laughs> but I don't really think that, that's, that that was his intention. And then the, the question of the flag, and the flag is really no different from a sculpture, only it's made of cloth and not made of stone. Um, so the question of the flag has a symbolic uh, uh, power. And so this quote from Nikki Haley upon the removal of the, of the Confederate flag from the State House, and I think it's really important that she says, no one should drive by the State House and feel pain. No one should drive by the State House and feel that they don't belong. And I think that that's true of, of any kind of public expression of an ideology that is simply no longer accepted and no longer acceptable. And we have our own Nathan Bedford Forrest uh, statue in the state capitol, along with other very famous Tennesseans. And there was legislation up that, that, uh, that said that we would basically keep the statue here. And Representative Johnny Shaw, uh, with his statement, it's kind of like putting a statue of Hitler in a Jewish community. And so that sensitivity to the public, I think, is something that is, is a valid consideration. And so, you know, I looked really hard, and I couldn't find any statues of Hitler like in public squares, and maybe you, have, you found some, but they're all removed, they're all taken down at, or destroyed at the end of World War II. And so there's this sense of, of you know, the need to sort of expunge these heroic, honorific images. And that, that, that quite, the, the word honor really is critical here, because what does a public statue do that if you remove it to a museum and, and, and contextualize it, doesn't necessarily do? In the public, everybody, whether you want to see it or not, you see it. You drive past it, you walk past it. You don't choose to go into a museum to see it, because it's right there. And the message of a public monument is that, that you are honoring the person that it is representing. And so if we don't really honor that person anymore, what function does it, that, that has no more function than, than an elevator list building. You know, it's just something that, uh, that, that you have to question the, the continuing legitimacy of retaining that thing. Now the question I would ask, and maybe Helmut will be able to help me with this, is if you had a, a, a neo-Nazi uh, political party in Germany, you know, that, that in one of the German states took power and decided to erect a monument of Hitler. How would that go over? How, how would people receive that? Would that be acceptable? You know, because it's, it's the same span of years after World War II to now as it was after Civil War to the, uh, to the Stone Mountain sculpture. And so I think it's a really compelling question. You know, and then would it be history? Or would it be somebody's idea of history, a revisionist idea of history? I know it does. I know. But if you, you know, it, d despite that, I mean, despite, I mean, how, you know, again, morally, ethically, you know, how would that be, how would that be viewed? Would, and what if a, what if a, a right-wing government took over in Germany and they rescinded the law? You know, so, I mean, it's a lot of what-ifs, but I think these are reasonable questions to ask. So you can recontextualize them. There's a, a movement in Richmond that has a, a, a group of, I think they're artists, I'm not sure exactly, uh, sort of telling us the other side of the story. So when you read, when you read the, ins the official inscription, it tells you how great and noble Lee was, and then you read this other inscription that looks very much like a historical plaque. This Confederate shrine was developed in an environment of oppression of African Americans, customary and legal, and aggressive historical revisionism. I'm reading it for those in the back who can't uh, see it from, from that distance. For a black person to question the construction of grand memorials to the defenders of the slave system in public space, much less oppose such erections, was to risk life and livelihood. Nonetheless, nonetheless some did, most notably John Mitchell, Jr., the editor. So I, you get the point. You, you get the idea that, that you can have sort of a, a, a textual assessment or consideration of the work that goes beyond what the object itself does. Now, the question I would have is how effective is that? Do people read it? Do people sort of, does the, does the visual have more power than the, than the linguistic? And I think it's, it's an important question. You know, those who want to read it will read it. Those who don't want to read it will still sort of think of the, of the uh, statue as being, being a, an, an appropriate object of reverence. Or you can intervene in another way. This is not a Confederate statue, but uh, this was the little girl statue that was placed in front of the, uh, the bull on uh, Wall Street. And of course, the sculptor of the bull is still alive, and he was really mad because he felt that the little girl being placed there really changed the meaning of his work, and it actually does. But maybe the argument about 
removing Confederate monuments should be, well, what do you add, what do you put next to them? What do you put them around them? Of course, we don't have limitless space, and so that's not a, always an easy opportunity, but it is one way of having, you know, having your art do your debating for you. So I thought it'd be interesting to look, well, how do you, maybe you need to come up with a framework. You know, a framework for assessing whether the, the, the uh, Confederate statuary on Monument Avenue is uh, worthy of being preserved because that was the capital of the Confederacy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, whether the, the uh, uh, statue in New Orleans should have been removed, whether the Nathan Bedford Forrest uh, uh, work should be removed. And so I thought it'd be interesting to look at the UNESCO World Heritage Site. After all, the Taliban destroyed the the Buddha, uh, uh, it, which was at a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And the question of, of you know, do you, you retain things that, re that represent singular works of genius, singular works of artistic genius, that exhibit an important interchange of human values. Now, that's, that in itself does not necessarily say that you only select the good values, but an interchange of human values, an exchange of human values, unique or at least exceptional testimony to a cultural tradition artistic and literary works of outstanding universal significance. You know, I don't necessarily think that, you, that the UNESCO guidelines would, would translate directly into, into what we might do, but I think some, some such discussion, I think, would be valuable because there may be instances where it would be so much more enlightening and so much more exciting to have that sort of counter-conversation, the, you know, the other sculpture, the other monument. When you think about the it's not quite the same thing, but you think about Maya Lin's Vietnam Veteran War Memorial. And any time I have been there or have seen pictures of anybody there, they're all at the wall. There isn't one of them who's standing there in front of that statue of the, of the, of the two figures, you know, that kind of classical uh, uh, representation of the wounded warrior. You know, I think people are moved by the wall. They're not moved by this kind of antique language of, uh, of figuration that, that heroic statuary oftentimes uh, uh, assumes and adopts. So I think that's probably all the time that I will take and uh, just uh, turn it over to Helmut. And then we'll have time for conversation. Thank you, that was really fascinating. Um, I will briefly outline the history of monuments in 19th and 20th century Germany and argue that while tearing down is sometimes necessary, the greater good is usually better served by layering commemorization allowing the monument landscape to reflect the authenticity and complexity of the historical record and to show that tension and difference is in fact essential to a nation's history. I will also argue that it is important to think of ways that citizens can be involved in the construction of monuments and that this demands at times, a certain resistance to the very monumentality of monuments. Finally, I will suggest that even in a society that is attempting to come to grips with its past, a certain amount of time has to go by before it can be done outside the passions that infuse political discussions close to the events. I will end by asking if the United States, and in particular the South, is at this point and we'll sketch out some of the answers as they appear to a non-specialist in American history. So let's start with Germany. Germany has, for a very long time, since the middle of the late, uh, since the middle of the 19th century, a fairly dense historical and patriotic landscape. It also has, since that time, now about 150 years, um, a long history of having some of those monuments torn down. Now, obviously, when we think about this, 
Oops. We think about um, Adolf Hitler, and in fact, almost, not almost, all of those monuments are torn down. Um, but very recently, you may have witnessed um, another such um, incident, less talked about this time around, maybe more problematic, maybe not, but those are communist uh, uh, monuments. The busts of Karl Marx and Lenin and Ernst Thälmann and other heroes of communism torn down in the 1990s. In addition to these two categories, the far left and the far right, it might surprise you that in German history there is also a third category of monuments that have also gotten torn down, or at least for a time. And these are monuments to the monarchs, the kings uh, of Prussia, of Germany, and this is because it was once thought that the sort of um, obedience of the Germans is really what um, funneled them into National Socialism, into fascism in the 1930s, and so therefore the victor nations after World War II were in fact very interested in the Germans not having all of those monarchical monuments like here of Wil Wilhelm up. Eventually in 1990 Wilhelm was put back on his pedestal. It does tell you that certain kinds of monuments accept being torn down, others perhaps less so. There's another aspect about the German monument landscape that I'd like to mention. Um, Germany, more so than the United States, has, especially in the first half of the 20th century, endured two cataclysmic wars in which a significant percent of first its military population and then its military and civilian population uh, perished in war. Even after the first such conflagration, World War I, the question was already posed, to what end was all that dying? This is posed especially to countries that are losers in war. In fact, when, when I first came to uh, Nashville, in 1991, I was very interested in the area around here. I'd never spent any time in the South, so I did go to bookstores in the small towns around here. I even went to uh, secondhand shops. I spent a lot of time looking at memorabilia. I was quite interested in the fact that um, it seemed to me probably in white South, or at least white Tennessee, there was quite an interest in National Socialism. Um, I asked people about this. I got some funny answers. Uh, one funny answer, which the person who told me was quite convinced about, was, well, yes, there's a great affinity between the South and Germany. And that affinity um, rests in the fact that we, the South, were, like the Germans, the better fighters. And we, the South, fought for the wrong cause. I don't want to, I'm not going to defend the position, but I will say that I think that there is one point in here that bears reflecting on. That is that countries that lose wars, like the South did, have a very different sensibility and investment in monuments than countries that typically win wars. Um, this is important, I think, um, in, in ways which are odd, to me anyways. I grew up in uh, north of Boston. I grew up in a family, my father was a Nixon Republican. When I grew up, I was told continually that the United States had never ever lost a war. Um, there was no sensibility about maybe the difficulty a nation can be in when it actually loses the war. Later on in life, as actually when I came here, I started to read historians like C. Van Woodward, and I started to read essayists and novelists like Robert Penn Warren, and they actually emphasized that one of the things that is distinctive about the South 
is that it lost a war, unlike, and unequivocally so, unlike the North. And this gives a, an almost ironic sensibility, uh, which is harder to find, especially when one thinks about world politics in the North. Whether that's true or not is maybe another question, but it's been interesting to me. Let me come back to the Mind Monument. I digress, I digress just a little bit there. Um, the heroic monument. First of all, it's harder for a losing country. And the reason is because you have to infuse heroism with a reason for the heroism. If it's not clear why the people died, heroic monuments are harder to produce. This is a, a sculptress named Kate Kolwitz, very famous, most of you probably know who she is. Her son died within the first weeks of World War I. Her son went into war thinking he was defending Germany, but also thinking he was fighting for a higher cause, the cause of culture or whatever it was that the propaganda at that time put forward. She believed that in order to preserve the, um, the spirit of her son in the monument, she had to reproduce something of that spirit in him. She worked for 15 years on this monument. This monument is not established until 1931. And the reason it took so long is that she could not figure out how to infuse her son's death with meaning. This is why all you have left is bereaving parents. And there is no meaning in the son's death. And the extra sadness of this monument comes from that understanding that after all this time, the artist was not able to put a kind of meaning onto the death of her son in this war in which millions of young men from Germany, France, England, uh, and other countries died. After World War II, Germany has a very different and in some ways similar problem. It also fought a war. The number of German deaths is very high. The number of Germans the number of people German killed is infinitely higher. How do you represent that in war? In, in, I'm sorry, in a monument. Leaving aside the war monuments, let's look, for example, at uh, the monuments to the Holocaust. Monuments sometimes work and sometimes don't. There is no way that they could make monumental monuments to the Holocaust. So they had to think about other kinds of monuments. One kind was a monument that made people think. That's what you actually always want in a monument. You want engagement. You want people to think about what the monument is about. Here's a monument on the outskirts of Hamburg. The, this, this, um, um, it's not an obelisk, it's just a pillar. This pillar, this square pillar, has a sheen of a special um, outside that you can write on. It's like a lead. And when you write on it, and when enough people write on it, the idea is that you write something reflective. People write on it. People write on it. After a while, this monument literally sinks. And so what it does is it says, only when you think will this, mon will this history slowly go away. Now, of course, everyone can figure out the problem. Um, some people wrote reflective things, and some people wrote, Bobby loves Susie, true love always. And then, on top of it all, the Nazis got into it too. And they also wrote stuff. So the monument ended up being a well-intentioned mess. Here's another well-intentioned mess. This was a, um, a postcard that was sent around to thousands of people until it was stopped by a huge petition, which I also signed. It says, the Holocaust never existed. Now, the person and the people who sent this out wanted, of course, to create 
a reaction to this. They wanted people to say, well, of course it existed. How can you send out this thing? But, of course, this didn't work either. Um, and this is an example of attempts. When you leave the heroic monument and you have other conceptions, those conceptions elicit things from the audience, sometimes things work, sometimes they don't. Here's a librarian's monument. On, the, on your left here is the monument to the burned books. It's in a, 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 a square in the middle of Berlin. What you do is you go up there it's, and you look down and you see, of course, empty shelves. And you imagine it has this funny effect of you put the back books back in with your mind. It's very simple. It fits bakes basically right in front of us. People crowd around it and think about the books, and they actively think what it is. It's a very successful monument. It's not big, but it draws people. Another monument uh, or plaque, which has been, especially since the 90s, put up in many, many German towns, are monuments to those places where the synagogue was either burnt or desecrated. There are lots of those places in Germany. Here is a map of more or less all of them. You can see the density of that landscape. And what you can now imagine is all those communities have to think about the business of putting a monument or a plaque or something that registers that on November 9th, 1938, the Nazis of this town, usually to the ovation of the townspeople, either burned or desecrated um, the holy temple of the Jewish community in that town. I haven't finished my counting, but I would say that at this point, maybe 60% of the communities have done that, which is remarkable. And it means there's a lot of work still left to go. There are other kind of monuments. I'm not going to, this is the Holocaust uh, Memorial in the middle of Berlin, or the, the memorial to the uh, murdered Jews of Europe, as it's more officially called. Um, this is not my favorite monument. I'm not going to go in why, but it does say, it was sort of decided upon after the unification of Germany. It does say this is what a unified Germany wants to have in the middle of its capital. And that is also an important statement, um, just like it's an important statement that the United States does not have the same kind of museum to slavery in the center of its capital as it does to the Holocaust. Another monument are called the stumbling stones, or in German they're called Stolpersteine. They're developed by an artist named Greg Deming. Uh, they started in 1992, but they really um, have their uptick in the late 90s and in the early th uh, 2000s. These are small square um, plaques that people buy um, and place in front of their houses in the streets of Berlin and in many cities in Germany, houses where Jews once lived before their deportation um, in 1941-42 and, and 1943. There are also, in the meanwhile, thousands of these monuments. Um, this is a map of those just in Berlin. And what this means, to do it means individual citizen participation. And that's one of the things that's great about them. It also means they're called stumbling stones. So it means that, that when you walk around, you literally stumble over these things, and then you are forced to think, what was this? Uh, there are many in other cities, too. And in fact, it has a funny situation of cities all, I don't want to say compete with each other, but, but if you have a situation where only a percentage of those stones represent the number of people who were deported from those cities, people can see which cities have been vigilant about it and, and which haven't. <clears throat> 
Okay, now just some concluding remarks um, about how I would see uh, the American uh, situation. We've talked about this graph. This is from the, um, uh, the uh, Southern um, Poverty Law, Cent uh, Law Center. Um, this is the graph that tells you more or less when all the Confederate monuments were made. You can see that um, there's a huge spike right at that moment when Jim Crow laws are introduced um, into uh, the South. And there is another spike um, during the Civil Rights Movement. So the timing of those Confederate monuments does in fact tell us about um, the reaction to um, African Americans in the public sphere. Um, you may, one may want to call that white supremacy, but these are clearly monuments that have a politics and a context that are not simply about the Civil War. Here on the top is a map of where they are, no surprise, predominantly in the South. This is another map, and here I just want to, in a way, want to make a concluding remark. Uh, this is a map, um, it's maybe a little bit too dark here, but these are um, reported lynchings. One of the, uh, I think, very powerful digital humanities projects is actually to locate the thousands of lynchings that did in fact occur in uh, the south, somewhat, some also in the north, um, in the years uh, after the Civil War. One of the reasons that this work is important to me is that it localizes them. It says not that lynching was a phenomenon that occurred somewhere in the South, but that it occurred in this neighborhood, in this community, by this community. And one of the things that I believe has to begin to happen, and I think that people who work in digital humanities can help this, is we have to locate and figure out where our history is so we can begin as a nation to represent it, not always with the big monuments in Washington, but from the ground up. And the ground up means from the communities, the many communities where good things have happened and bad things. I think, too, we need to do we need to work much harder on, for example, um, the commemorization of the civil rights movement. Not just in the big sense, but in the small sense. And so I come back to this notion about layering and placing monuments next to each other. Sure, I agree. Part of the strategy needs to be to take down some of the egregious monuments. But I think you, one will not get very far with that strategy, A, but I think the more effective, deeper and long-lasting issue is how to generate a groundswell of movement that counteracts those monuments with other kinds of monuments and together to make a more truthful historical dialogue in our communities. Thank you. All right. So, so we are going to open the floor to questions and thoughts and dialogue and we're all going to play nice and have wonderful thoughts together. Yes, wonderful. Excellent. Do like that for the civil rights movement, or for Native Americans, or for sla victims of slavery. Germans, of course, cataloged the people they killed, so we know their names and we know when they died. But in America, we just slaughtered them without asking their names. I think that um, I you're right about with, with well. Uh, 
First of all, I would say that even with respect to that, historians have, for decades now, put together much more precise and detailed information than we used to have. And so I do think we have, even in the case of, of Native Americans, we have, we have more of a, uh, a place to start than I think we usually think we do. Um, I think also, I mean, just in my own experience, we know a lot about uh, Indian, like the places of Indian history in Davidson County. We know a lot about it in Massachusetts, where I grew up, and yet the, the amount of commemoration and, and, and signage and monument, monumentalization, or it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be this, but, you know, markers, I guess. Um, is by comparison very small. The same is true, although the civil rights movement is better about this, but there is a lot of civil rights organizing that went on in this or that small town by a lot of unsung heroes. And we need to have a more concerted effort to sing them and to, in the end, put these histories on our map and in our communities. And there, I think, I think it's time to help. I also think, you know, it's been one of the things when you look at that map of the um, Confederate monuments. So there's a kind of the darker interpretation is certainly that it's, it's um, uh, white supremacy and that it's about the, uh, it's what comes along with the Jim Crow laws and the and the redefinition of what the South was fighting for. But when I put that up on my, a public account, or shared it, because it's, it's not from me, um, uh, one person from my hometown rather naively just said, well, it, isn't it because the Civil War people more or less died about 50 years afterwards? And there is some truth to that too. And we are at a place where the civil rights leaders are either quite old now or have passed. And this is another reason why I think now is the time. Uh, my question is about misappropriation of a monument. And I can think of mainly one example, and I thought maybe you can think of others. The one I'm thinking about is in Paris, how there's the Diana Monument, which really isn't the Diana Monument. It's outside the tunnel where she was killed. But people have used the monument, and I can't remember if it's to World War I or um, if it's the, the soldier, but it's uh, you know, the kind of the top of the, the monument of the, the eternal. But it's, you know, people kind of misappropriate it and call it the Diana Monument and leave flowers there for her all the time, marking her death. But I wondered if you can think of other examples where people have taken a monument and kind of recontextualized that monument or memorial. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know about that particular instance, but I do know as somebody who thinks a lot about art and the way people make meaning from art and the intent that goes into the creation of a work of art and how that intent may or may not live. You know, and I think that that's, you know, when, and this has, goes back to the, uh, to the uh, uh, you know, adulation of certain objects, certain uh, things that, that uh, may not deserve adulation or that may have been re uh, invented or, or made for uh, uh, a completely different reason. Um, so, and I, I do think that the meaning of a work of art almost always, in the end, sort of inheres in the person who's sort of responding to it. And so, you may look at, uh, you know, anything and, uh, and feel that it's about something. And, and you're, you know, the, the odds are that you're not exactly in sync with what the original intention of the creation of the thing was but that still gives you some sort of dialogue with, with the object. I think the more you know, clearly, the more likely it is that you will interact with the object in, in a way that it was meant to be interacted with. 
space, time, uh, your own history, your own expectations, I mean, all of this, I think, is, is a part of it. That was really kind of a mealy-mouthed answer, and I apologize. <laughs> Can I just add to this? Um, it is also possible to make good monumental use of bad monuments. Um, you know, in commun former Communist East Germany, uh, they do this a lot now. They've kept up, you know, the heroic, some of the heroic uh, monuments to Marx and to Lenin, and, and they haven't kept there to keep the Stalin ones, but, and now they basically do, um, you know, critical, reflective tours to them. They, they don't say, at, at first they tore them all down, um, but now it's also possible to go to them and um, have plaques around them, but also have people where you discuss them. Berlin is easy because people go to Berlin to live 20th, I mean, have a sense of 20th century history, so there's a big audience, but a lot of that could be done. I mean, I think that with, for example, um, some of our more problematic statues downtown, I think that is exactly what should happen, that there should be city-sponsored guides to them. And those guides should be, you know, critically honest with, about it. Yeah, uh, it's been uh, a good 15 years since I was in, uh, in Germany last. And I was wondering what the status was of the eagle's nest. Is it uh, still uh, as restricted as it was? And uh, at the time I was there, that was it was a year or two after the anniversary of Hitler's death yeah. or uh, his birth, and they talked about shutting the, the the facility down, and that that night the the floor of the valley all around it was was uh, ablaze with fires. Yeah. I, I haven't been up there. Um, I've almost gone up there, but I didn't. Uh, so I don't know precisely the answer to this. I will say that there are a whole series of um, places like this. The, the most famous is, of course, the bunker, yeah. right? It's still underneath there. There is no sign telling you how to get there. Uh, they're worried, of course, that um, Neo-Nazis will use it as a center, as a pilgrimage site. When, when I was there at the Eagle's Nest, there was a, there was a sign that when you enter the elevator and when you get off the elevator, there are signs that says, no tours may be conducted in German. And uh, it was in the uh, U.S. occupied zone. I refuse to use the word American. But uh, <laughs> but in the U.S. zone, it was there, and uh, so that uh, I was quite surprised when I was there. And that I, you know, it's very clear the signs. You know, this is also a problem here. I mean, this is also an issue of these. I mean, in Charlottesville, that's now going to become an even bigger issue, I fear, and that is the degree to which these monuments become rallying points. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Another question for Helmut, if I could. Um, so I, I'm curious about the different valences for these uh, East German uh, monuments. And let me just compare three, and I'm wondering about your comments on this. So you, you have the Marx Engels monument in Alexanderplatz, which is a very popular monument, small, but always draws a crowd, crowd and it's well maintained. Then you mentioned the Ernst Tailman monument. Well, you refer to Ernst Tailman monuments in general. There's one in the Ernst Tailman Park that's quite big, and it's constantly defaced. So you know it's been preserved, but it's just covered with graffiti, and it just seems like almost that's the official policy, just to cover it with graffiti. Um, and then the, the third monument, which is kind of interesting, I don't know how visited it is, is Treptower Park, which you know is the large Soviet memorial, which is grand and it used to be the center of, of sort of. Um, East German parades and, and recognition. Now it's just almost abandoned. It just seems like it's out there and, and you know, no one pays any attention to it, but it's, it's not defaced. Uh, 
Um, and I'm wondering, you know, is it because people recognize the Soviets did really lose millions and millions of soldiers, so they respect it to a certain extent, even though it's, it's a kind of imperial monument? The, the tailman is, is a homegrown figure that they, they like to, to face and make fun of or in a certain yeah. sense. Uh, and Marx and Engels, they, they have a kind of you know, respect for in the sense that it's, it's intellectual history. I mean, that's the way that I read it, but I'm not sure if you would agree. It sounds right to me. I mean, I, I, um, I don't know if they, because you're absolutely right about the monument in Treptower Park. That's, it's a big, I was actually going to show you a picture of it. It's a big, oops, it's a big, you can tell I'm not a karaoke singer. Uh, it's a big, um, giant Soviet memorial. Um, and I, I assume, though I don't know, I assume that it has police protection around the clock. Because uh, I think, especially the more you get outside Berlin, the more sort of right-wing stuff you encounter, and the more likely something like that is to be defaced. But I can't answer that with certainty. The short story. Well, well the, I will say that when we were asked to do this, we uh, were told that this was supposed to be a debate. And when I heard Mark's position, I, I said, I, I feel like I'd rather hug my opponent than spar with him. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I think that in, in essential positions, we're not so far apart. Can, can I interrupt you for, for four seconds? Can he just kind of, can you repose your question a little bit just for the sake of video? I'm sorry. Sure. Thank you. The question was to ask uh, Helmut and Mark to speak to one another. Uh, Helmut began his presentation speaking about layering, um, citizens being involved, um, the resistance of the maybe the bigness or grandeur, the monumentality of monuments, and um, allowing time to diffuse passions around that. Um, and Mark ended his presentation speaking about creating a framework for assessing um, what to do with our controversial monuments, different from the UNESCO um, uh, evaluation, but something that's more particular to our situation. And I'm wondering if our panelists would speak to one another about that. You know, I, I'm not sure that we are in a different place. Um, I think that in terms of what appeals to me, both in what I see in Germany and um, what I can imagine happening here, I would stress the small work, the community work, the marking work that we in the academy can also help a lot with. Um, and that, that's a, a, a route forward or a path forward that I would want to emphasize. And maybe you did a little bit less and maybe you would have a slightly different, but these, I wouldn't see these as mutually exclusive. I think it comes down to a question of the past and the future. You know, what do we do with the past and what do we do with the future? Future's a little bit easier because we have arts commissions, we have mechanisms for public input. Uh, when, uh, when the Robert E. Lee monument was erected, uh, 
They didn't ask the black community how they felt about the Robert E. Lee Monument. They didn't ask anybody who you know, might have vetoed it or might have, might have expressed dismay. Uh, and again, if you did express dismay and you remember, uh, if you were uh, the, the publisher of the black newspaper, you put your life at risk. Um, so, so as we move forward, the small monument, I like your idea of monuments not necessarily having to be monumental. I mean, I think that, uh, in, in fact, the language of monuments, when you look at that Lee or, or um, uh, even, the, even the grotesque uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest st uh, statue, those are all sort of inspired by these Roman models. You know, so it's a really antique language that I think we can look at today and, and not really be stirred by one way or the other. You know, somebody sitting upright on a horse doesn't really, you know, ring our chimes. Uh, how do you... How do you move forward with creating a language for the 21st century, and especially as we honor our civil rights pioneers, as we honor other heroes that uh, that may, um, whether we put them in the in the public square with the Confederate statuary or whether we replace the Confederate statuary with them, what language do we use? And I think the other thing we didn't really talk about, well, what you, you can replace a statue, you can take it down, you can destroy it. You can, you can melt it down, um, but if you take it down, what do you do with it? Where do you put it? What is the right place for it? And of course, I think you know, museums, museums of history are places that are dedicated to the uh, contextual, contextualization of such objects, and so you would understand them sort of as a part of, a, of the larger whole. Um, you know, I, I do argue that history is not necessarily embodied, you know, the, what we know by looking at a monument is far less than what we know by reading the historical record. So I think that, that the monument is simply just like a tip of something much, much larger than itself. Um, but I, I, I think in essence, one of the points that I really liked about, about Helen's presentation was his, um, his discussion of the loser, you know, the, the idea of the losing country having to come up with some sort of justification for their sacrifice. And of course, that's, that's nothing new. We all know that, that, that every losing you know, uh, uh, side in a conflict uh, uh, does have to feel that their, their loss wasn't completely in vain or they stood for something noble. Um, you know, we look back in, at the historical record and there, there are no historians of any, of any consequence who will say that the Civil War is about anything but Slavery. It may have been about about other things rolled into it, but slavery was sort of the the centerpiece of that. Slavery, by any any in any culture, by any gesture, any any stretch of the imagination, is an evil thing. It's a wrong thing, and to permit embodiments of of evil, however you want to frame it, if 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 it's your heritage, to permit the embodiments of evil to dominate the public square. I think is is inviting. It, it's it's insulting to people, and so I, I would say that that there is you know you did acknowledge that there are, are instances where things should be taken down, things should be removed. Um, other instances where something could be contextualized either either through a signage or through a competing vision of uh, of a work of art. And so I, I don't think we're we're so far apart from each other. You know, I, I, I also agree that slavery is not good. But until we had ways of multiplying manpower, a man's power, slavery was an element of almost every society, including the Native American society. Uh, so that's one comment. And the other one I would make is... Uh, the other one that I, that I would make is... We have, um, we have here in Nashville a place that's called Fort Negley. And it's, um, I, in looking at what was, has been going on around it, I see both the, the uh, and I'm not in the, the other organizations, but in the union, in the union camp, which is the um, Donaldson camp of the Grand Army of the Republic, and then there's a Civil War roundtable, there is a collective interest on the 
survivors of those men who fought to preserve Fort Negley. Uh, and it becomes a monument. And then the other, another issue is the U.S. has lost the war. It lost Vietnam. And we may be on the way of losing two more. But, uh, you know, insurgencies outlast invaders. And I give up. For me, the, the, the Fort Negley uh, uh, reference is really, is really pertinent, of course. It's one of, the, one of the things that we can do to preserve an actual and authentic aspect of Civil War history that's not seen through rose-tinted glasses, you know, 50 or 100 years later. I mean, it really is. It, it, and it has to do with place, I think. You know, when you, when you talk about, I mean, you mentioned Hitler's bunker. You know, there, there's a certain kind of, of historical value. I mean, there, there's an absolute historical value in preserving, in preserving sites in which important major events happened. And even, you know, I would argue for if, if, uh, if there were statuary to the Confederate generals that had been constructed in 1863 as a way of rallying the, uh, the southern states around the cause, then it probably, to me, has a little more authenticity than if it's something done 60 or 70 years later as a way of sort of asserting, again, your own control over, over another race. Um, it, it is true that slavery existed in, in a great many, has existed in a great many societies. It continues to exist today. And it continues to be evil. If I could just add to that. Um, <laughs> Historically speaking, uh, slavery is a very old institution. But it is also true that in the North Atlantic, um, sometimes circa mid-18th century. Um, starting with Quaker meetings, um, it came to be seen as an evil. Now, it didn't seem to everyone right away like that, but by the beginning of the 19th century, that was a widespread understanding in the West. Peculiar was the... Um, the du how long the United States kept its slave system. So there is, now it's not necessarily peculiar compared to Brazil, for example, um, but it is peculiar compared to the other um, North Atlantic countries with which we usually associate. Um, ourselves, whether that's right or wrong is another question. So I do think that there is something in the timing and the duration of the slave system in the South that has to do with more than just the economics of it. And insofar as it has to do with the economics of it, it has to do with the economics of a planter class. Um, basically, um, guarding to the very last nail um, its privileged position over what is essentially forced labor. So I think that, um, I, I do think that one has to make, make that, make that dis distinction. In terms of uh, slavery, just uh, at the beginning of the Civil War, the uh, wealthiest, the num the, uh, there was more wealth in Mississippi than there was in any place else in the country because of the slave holdings in Mississippi. So they, it was, you know, it, it never, it doesn't justify it, but it shows how important that was to the South, to, to that economy. Yes, but, and, but and who, who was it really important to, right? Only the, only the landowners. Right. That's, yeah. only, that's the only people who it was important for. I, I, don't, I, just, I, I don't disagree with you that yeah. slavery is bad. No, no, it, I, it, I'm not implying that. I'm just, I'm just saying that when we speak about the South and um, the interest, or not the interest in slavery, that's not quite the right verb, but the, um, 
the holding on to the institution of slavery, we are also talking about a very small segment of even the white South. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it, you look at Lawrence, yeah. Kansas. Yeah. And, and, yeah. You, know, you look at East Tennessee. Texas. I saw you right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's in East Tennessee. I mean, we must have some people from East Tennessee. Was not very invested in that in, because it's an area of small farming. Yeah. Yeah, and they fought for it. So it's a very calm. I think that it would be great if, if in this discussion about the South and the monuments and, and African Americans and white Southerners, we also had, a, in a way, a geographically more differentiated understanding of what the South really is. Because the South becomes like a, a signifier for something. Mm -hmm. But as we know, it's, it's complicated. See, as, as someone who grew up in the West, in a state that had no Confederate monuments, one of the few. Yeah. Um, I grew up in Utah, which has its own form of slavery, yeah. which is being practiced today. I think one of the larger questions is really not just about slavery, it's about race. And um, you grew up in Utah. Uh, it's not so well known outside of the West and not even that well known, in the, especially in the Southwest, that there were many thousands of lynchings of Chinese, of Mexicans, of Chicanos. Um, these, these have completely escaped sort of public notice in the public record. Um, and of course, when we talk about our, uh, the Native American, the genocide of the Native Americans, I mean, it's all part of this larger, larger pattern in which one race feels that it is superior to another race. And that, I think, is sort of the core of what inspires the, the neo-nationalist movement today, the neo-Nazi movement today. Um, it's not just about black and white, it's about white and everybody else. Yeah, in, in, uh, in Utah, the, um, Brigham Young decreed that the Mormons could not participate in hard rock mining. And so that all went to the Gentiles. There was Roman Catholic, uh, Kearns, it was, Hogo, who was the uh, Episcopal, and then the Japanese and the Chinese were the miners, for the most part. And, it, it, and it, Butte, Montana no longer has a Chinatown, and it had a thriving one at one time. Do any of you know where legal slavery still exists in the United States? National legal slavery, legal in the United States. Sanctioned by the Constitution, prisons, exactly, penitentiaries. Uh, we're doing a show, this is a little plug, uh, we're doing an exhibition on Angola, the, the uh, penitentiary in Louisiana, which is a work farm, essentially, in which the, uh, the uh, uh, prisoners have no choice, but they have to work. And so that, and, and constitutionally, that is the only exception to the, I'm sorry? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, you all. Can I give a closing thought? I know you all are ready to go. I'm sorry. I just, I'm dying. I'm burning. So a couple of thoughts. Number one, um, if we think of slavery in terms of, of money or power or any of those things and take it out to humanism, then we completely eradicate and make okay what's happening right now today in Libya. There's absolute slave trade going on right now, today, in Libya. Immigrants are fleeing from other places in the world to use Libya as a, a pipeline to a better life and a better world, and they're absolutely being sold into slavery right now, today. That's a real thing. Also, I happen to be Puerto Rican, and Puerto Rico was one of the last um, Caribbean states with Brazil to eradicate slavery, so that's always a very sad um, fact for me. And um, the prison, the school to prison pipeline is very real. So what's happening with uh, young black men 
young men of color in general is a direct pipeline to these prisons, and prisons are the biggest business in slavery happening right now in America. And I'm off my soapbox. Thank you all very much.